Why does Japan claim it can surpass China in rare earths? Why is Japan daydreaming? Hey everyone, I'm Old Lu. Today, I'm going to reveal a big secret hidden behind the international tech and resource competition. Recently, Japan has been making frequent moves in the rare earth sector, with various dazzling news reports. Beneath the surface, this actually conceals Japan's ambition to attempt a curve overtake in the global rare earth supply chain. But can this truly be achieved? Don't rush. Next, I'll take you step by step into this rare earth chess game, full of calculations and challenges, to see what Japan is really up to and what this means for global technological development. This is a major event that most people would find hard to grasp all at once, but today, you've definitely come to the right place. Next, let's dive into this intense rare earth competition and see how much chance Japan's so-called breakthrough really has, why China can sit back and relax in this contest, and what kind of global tech industry trends are reflected behind it all. The Rare Earth Crisis of Japanese Automakers Two months ago, a major event occurred in the automotive industry. The venerable Japanese company Suzuki Motors suddenly announced the discontinuation of its Swift model. This news immediately caused a stir within the Japanese industry. You might think that a car company discontinuing a model is common in the fiercely competitive auto market, so what's the big deal? But this time it was different. Behind the discontinuation, a huge crisis facing the entire Japanese automotive industry was exposed, a rare earth shortage. According to reliable sources, the rare earth inventories of Japan's eight major automakers are critically low with only three to six months of supply remaining. This is no small figure. Rare earths play a crucial role in modern automotive manufacturing, especially in the new energy vehicle sector. From car engines and batteries to various electronic control systems, all rely on the involvement of rare earth elements. The source of this entire crisis is China's announcement of export controls on key rare earth minerals. For a long time, Japan has been highly dependent on Chinese rare earths. Data shows that for some critical heavy rare earth elements, Japan relies almost 100% on imports from China. China's export control measure was like a heavy punch, hitting the Achilles heel of the Japanese automotive industry directly. Suzuki's discontinuation is just a microcosm of the difficulties facing the Japanese automotive industry. Other car companies are also precarious in this rare earth crisis. This also shows us how important the stability of resource supply is in the global industrial chain. Once the supply of critical resources encounters problems, the entire industry can be paralyzed. The Japanese automotive industry has always been known for its advanced technology and complete industrial chain. But in the face of rare earths, this critical resource, it appears so fragile. This also serves as a warning to other countries. While pursuing technological progress, it is essential to pay attention to the diversification of resource supply and strategic reserves. Otherwise, even the strongest industry may suffer heavy losses due to resource shortcomings. Japan's pie in the sky. Seemingly beautiful technological breakthroughs. Under the dual pressure of U.S. tariff wars, sucking blood, from the front and China's rare earth controls from behind, Japan did not sit idly by. Instead, it quietly painted a big picture for the Americans. Japanese company Proterial, formerly Hitachi Metals, sensationally announced the development of two types of motor magnets that do not require heavy rare earths. This news immediately captured global attention. They hinted to the outside world that this technological breakthrough could allow Japan to overtake China's rare earth advantage and break free from its dependence on Chinese rare earths. Doesn't that sound incredibly inspiring? If it could truly be achieved, Japan would have fought a beautiful comeback in the global rare earth game. On the surface, the Japanese company's technological approach indeed addresses a pain point. Traditional neodymium magnets, during manufacturing, require the addition of heavy rare earth elements like dysprosium, dy, and terbium, tb, to enhance heat resistance, and these heavy rare earth elements are precisely what Japan relies most heavily on importing from China. The new technology developed by Japan uses iron oxide as the base material, employs mainstream processes for mass production, 
and claims to be able to directly replace traditional magnets without changing motor designs. This plug and play feature was heavily emphasized by Japan in discussions with U.S. automakers, even packaged as a disruptive advantage. Not only that, Japan also used the opportunity of the EU-Japan summit to bundle the Greenland Mineral Development Cooperation with rare earth-free magnets, attempting to construct a grand narrative of a resource plus technology dual breakthrough. The future blueprint they depicted is reduce reliance on heavy rare earths through new rare earth-free magnet technology. At the same time, develop Greenland's mineral resources to achieve diversification of rare earth supply. This way, Japan would seemingly be able to completely break free from its dependence on Chinese rare earths and occupy a more favorable position in the global rare earth supply chain. But is this truly the case? Behind this seemingly beautiful technological breakthrough are their hidden secrets. Let's analyze it in depth. From a technical perspective, although the new motor magnets use iron oxide as the base material, seemingly solving the problem of heavy rare earth dependence, their performance has numerous shortcomings. Experimental data shows that the magnetic energy product of ferrite magnets is only one-fifth that of neodymium magnets, meaning their magnetic strength is far inferior to traditional neodymium magnets. To compensate for insufficient magnetism, the motor volume needs to be increased by more than 30%. For electric vehicles aiming for lightweight and compact design, this is undoubtedly a fatal flaw. After all, the battery range of electric vehicles has always been a key concern for consumers, and increasing motor volume will not only increase the vehicle's weight but also take up more space, thus affecting battery layout and range. Furthermore, from a time-cost perspective, even with optimistic estimates, it would take until 2035 for this technology to achieve commercialization. Over the next decade, the Japanese automotive industry will still face the risk of supply chain disruptions. A report from the U.S. Geological Survey, USGS, directly shattered Japan's illusion, stating that even if the technology is fully applied, Japan will still need to import 60% of its heavy rare earths from China before 2030. This indicates that in the short term, Japan simply cannot break free from its reliance on Chinese rare earths. Japan's so-called rare earth free. It simply doesn't hold water in the field of high-end motors, and the so-called curve overtake is more like a carefully crafted propaganda tactic. Japan's approach is actually using a technological concept to attract U.S. support and funding. On one hand, they demonstrate the possibility of technological substitution to the U.S., attempting to gain political support and joint R&D funds. On the other hand, they use the U.S. market to share R&D costs and accelerate commercialization. However, U.S. policymakers are likely not unaware of this. Riding the wave to overtake. Calculation. When the Japanese company announced it would not make motors, only sell magnets, its ambition to control downstream industries through material patents was clearly revealed. While this model can, to some extent, reduce Japan's short-term risks, it shifts costs to U.S. automakers. Increased motor volume means redesigned car bodies, adjusted battery layouts, and a complete reshaping of the entire supply chain, and these costs will ultimately be absorbed by the market. This also leads to a hidden rift of mutual calculation beneath the seemingly close technological alliance between the U.S. and Japan. In today's increasingly fierce global technology competition, all countries are striving for technological breakthroughs and industrial upgrades. Japan's attempt to develop rare earth free magnet technology to break free from its reliance on Chinese rare earths is well intentioned, but to widely promote it and try to use it as leverage for cooperation with the US, while the technology is still immature and has obvious performance flaws, is undoubtedly a risky move. This approach could not only mislead US automakers and affect the development direction of the global electric vehicle industry, but also put Japan in a more passive position in the rare earth game. We should view technological innovation objectively and rationally, not be misled by seemingly beautiful propaganda, but deeply analyze the feasibility, practicality, and sustainability of the technology. Only in this way can we make correct decisions in the global technology industry competition. Hidden Concerns of Japan's Multi-Pronged Breakthrough In the Rare Earth Supply Chain Facing the Rare Earth Supply Dilemma 
Japan is not just content with seeking technological breakthroughs. They are also launching a multi-pronged breakthrough in the rare earth supply chain. First, Japan's diplomatic team, in just three months, reduced the proportion of rare earth imports from India by 12%. This sounds like a significant achievement, but there are many underlying. India's own rare earth production is limited, and its mining and processing technologies are relatively backward. Japan's reduction of imports from India is not because it found a better alternative source but is preparing for another, larger plan, betting on the Greenland project. Greenland's rich rare earth resources are no longer a secret. Japan is attempting to cooperate with Greenland to develop local rare earth mines, thereby diversifying its rare earth supply. But the ideal is grand, while reality is often harsh. Based on environmental assessment results, it will take at least five years for the Greenland mine to commence production. For the Japanese automotive industry, which is facing critically low rare earth inventories, these five years are simply too long. Distant water cannot quench a nearby fire. During these five years, Japan's automotive industry may suffer heavy losses due to rare earth shortages and may even fall far behind in the global automotive industry competition. In addition to seeking new breakthroughs in mineral resources, Japan has also turned its attention to rare earth recycling technology. Shinetsu Chemicals Waste Magnet Purification Technology is a representative example. Theoretically, recycling rare earth elements from waste magnets can not only reduce reliance on external mineral resources but also achieve resource recycling, which is a very environmentally friendly and sustainable practice. However, the reality is startling. Shinetsu Chemicals Waste Magnet Purification Technology has a recovery rate of less than 15% and a purity of only 95%. In comparison, China's rare earth smelting standard is as high as 99.99%. The gap between the two is clear at a glance. This is like a person trying to fill a huge pool with a spoon that can only scoop up a small amount of water. It's clearly unrealistic. Japan's multi pronged breakthrough strategies in the rare earth supply chain, though seemingly comprehensive, are in fact fraught with difficulties at every turn. Whether it's the long production cycle of the Greenland project or the low recovery rate and purity of recycling technology, Japan's desinicization plan appears somewhat inadequate. These data and real-world situations indicate that it is almost an impossible task for Japan to break free from its reliance on Chinese rare earths in the short term. Their so-called desinicization is more like a distant fantasy. In the context of increasingly fierce global resource competition, countries are striving to build their own resource security systems. Japan's attempts in the rare earth supply chain reflect its emphasis on resource security but also highlight its dilemma in resource strategy. A nation's resource security depends not only on whether it possesses abundant resource reserves but also on its discourse power and the global resource market, its technical level of resource development and utilization, and its control over resource supply chains. In these aspects, Japan has clear gaps compared to China. This also serves as a reminder to other countries. When formulating resource strategies, all factors must be fully considered. One cannot blindly follow trends or neglect one's own actual situation. Only in this way can one remain invincible in global resource competition.